If you can look in well, the... uh, there you go. Yes. Okay. Oh, perfect. Hello. Together, thank you very much for this invitation. I'm a little bit nervous uh, for this webinar, to be honest. Thank you, uh, Alessandra, for your invitation. So to the topic today would be a little bit the questions and also debates on how we can design psychotherapy research designs actually and if we just go a little bit to um to a theoretical if we just take a look on empirical data in psychotherapy research we could say that we have different perspectives uh, in psychotherapy for example patients therapists and observers that would be one important aspect of psychotherapy research designs a second consideration would be what's the level of abstraction we could talk about particular sessions but also therapy primary studies or meta-analysis so it's a little bit the question of generalizability how generalizable uh, how general how general theories are in psychotherapy research so but first i suppose we need a little bit a definition of psychotherapy research and me personally i like this definition of molder Psychotherapy research as an interdisciplinary integration of clinical psychological theories of pathology, intervention, and health, recognizing the challenges of dissemination and implementation. Me personally, I like this definition because it accepts, it accepts challenges in our field. So, and I would like to talk a little bit also today about challenges in psychotherapy research. One argument could be, or one challenging could challenge could be efficacy of specific interventions. This is quite a huge debate behind. And the challenge here is that we could argue, oh huh, well, Psychotherapy research is not so complicated. We have here just therapists and the patient and she or her has a diagnosis, for example, um, generalized anxiety disorders. And then we just take the empirically validated or empirical evidence-based treatment that uh, is particularly designed for these type of patients for these disorders. Okay, this is a very logical and also very well introduced framework. And if we go a little bit into psychotherapy history, then particularly we see almost all orientations have one argument. Uh, that or a claim and actually it's the claim that an argument a psychotherapy argument for sustainability this means for example that evidence-based therapy is more effective at the follow-up than other maybe not evidence-based therapies or psychodynamic therapies are more Substained have a longer efficacy than the other treatments and so on. So there are actually in the literature, these arguments are quite reasonable. We could say, okay, on a theoretical point of view, all these different arguments are well, have a theoretical background. So it's a little bit the question if everybody would say me or we are more sustainable than the others, this is a wrong argument then because it should have one argument should be a little bit better than the others. Yes? Okay. 
Okay, we did several meta-analyses and I hope that you are a little bit now interested in the results if for the arguments that some treatments are more sustainable than the others. And here are the effects. Here are the effects. Oops, interesting. No argument, and these are the really, I would say, these are the selling factors of psychotherapy that we are more sustainable for particular psychotherapies than others. This argument is, or these four arguments aren't um, on a meta-analytic point of view, really there is not strong evidence that one particular argument is uh, for a sustainable, more sustainable therapy. That's interesting. So, on a methodological point of view, we could say or we could discuss that maybe, for example, hmm, yeah, we have missing data in the follow-up assessment after six months or 12 months and so on. And of course, this missing data maybe would reduce powers to detect effects. We also could discuss or connect discuss it that in many RCTs we have additional treatments, psychotherapies. 50% of patients could have an additional psychotherapy within five years, which is interesting. So that would be a huge confound actually. But also, there are patients that do not really get better within psychotherapy in chronic conditions. Maybe even in a very long-term perspective. So, the sustainability argument is on a methodological point of view a very tricky one because there are many confounders within time that would just challenge these sustainability arguments or to find uh, sustainability in favor to one uh, treatment than to the other. So now to get, and that's the more imp most important thing now, to get this to a debate or a challenge, we could say, oh, interesting. Probably, especially on a long-term perspective, the sustainability or the, or the specificity argument probably is a little bit overestimated if we just take all the debates in the literature about treatment efficacy of particular psychotherapies. Now we could say, ah, this is difficult. That can't be actually. It, it, we have to find better ways because this is wrong. This is, or even this is scary. Or we could say, oh no, these results are super interesting. And actually, it's a lot of variation that we do can address with this debate. And this is interesting. Where, where is the unexplained? variability within the studies. Okay, and this brings me to the next debate. Or we could argue in a design that maybe if we have just two groups that we compare group A versus group B, then maybe this is an overall effect, but maybe there there are some therapists that are better in a group than the others. So then we would just argue maybe it's these are the particular therapists that makes the efficacy or the effectiveness and not so much the intervention. So now we are a little bit a level from the overall treatment we get more specific to the therapists. And also here we have a huge debate and if we go a little bit into the history of psychotherapy and psychotherapy research, then at the beginning of therapy, it was 
the discussion if there is a personality, a therapist personality. And there were huge discussions about, or also debates about therapist personalities. And I suppose now in the last 10 years, we have a reappraisal or a reinvestigation of therapists and what skills could be important for the therapist. And actually, we just could go in every, probably in every area of psychology and could have our hypothesis that the skills of this particle or the particle concept could have an influence of, um, on therapist skills within these different psychology traditions. I would just like to show you some examples for, from our research group. So, and I, I don't think these are really good studies or something like this. It's really just more examples that we can discuss. And what I would like to present you is a study from Henning Schottke. And what he did is actually he developed an assessment center for therapist skills, like the Anderson um, assessment center, but this, now this assessment center here uh, proposed from Schottke was conducted in groups, within small groups. And what we did here in this study, we just predicted um, the us we had the assessment of the the actually of the trainees at the beginning of a therapy training, and then we predicted outcome evaluated by the patients STL ninety. So the question was if we can predict with this uh, three G this assessment if this three G is predictive for symptom change in um, clients. And what you can see here is, yes, we have a little bit of effect to our, this trip case is a little bit predictive in sense that persons or therapists with higher skills have a little bit higher outcomes in clients. And most important or interestingly, the more traditional se selection of trainees in the sense that the experts are selecting their trainees, this selection was not significant or not predictive for treatment outcomes evaluated by patients. And these results, most important or also interesting, were independent of the theoretical orientation of the training. This means psychodynamic or CBT therapists. So this is a little bit an indication that maybe there would be a common factor within therapists, maybe in personal skills that could have an impact on outcome. Okay. To get to the debate here, it's actually not so clear on this framework if we just talk about therapists as person or it's now the context of the therapist maybe what clinic a clinic factor or also the mix of patients or, or also just country specific issues so it's really the question a little bit it's the person that makes the therapist effect or maybe more the context. And if we go to person, it's really also the question a little bit if we just assess the stereotype of a therapist or and that this would be in general effective, but maybe not for a very particular patient. So, Actually, also here, this debate is not finished or this challenge. We just, I suppose, start to get more insights about therapist effects. So, 
we have two debates here you now or challenges the efficacy challenge and the therapist effect challenge then we could argue okay maybe because in psychotherapy is quite yeah interactive between two persons at least two persons maybe relation between the persons or the maybe psychotherapy is a dyadic concept we could have this hypothesis so does relationship has an effect on outcome and this task force from John Norcross was astonishing that many different concepts, psychotherapy concepts that integrate relationship aspects are positively connected with outcome. And if we go just to this alliance meta-analysis very quickly, then we can see, oh, astonishing that we have quite a huge variability within these results. So we have a tendency in the positive direction. That means that a good alliance is actually also slightly positively correlated to outcome. And most important for me personally are these cases here that we have very few studies where negative alliance is positively correlated with outcome. So if we get a summary, a summary of this table here, we could just could say that high alliance or high relationships aspects aren't a good, pre, uh, a good predictive factor or a risk factor for bad outcomes. So you could now could say, ah, oh, maybe this is a little bit trivial or easy to say, yeah, of course, uh, phew, a bad relationship is, is a risk factor. But on the other hand, if we go a little bit into the history of psychotherapy, maybe 50 years back, I suppose there were quite a lot of discussions that just discussed that therapies need to be a little bit uh, hard and tough and that too much well-being in the therapies would be a bad sign. Maybe even in the political discussions today such ideas could be a topic and what we can see here in this graph is that this argument is not really em empirically validated that we need to challenge the patients in sense that we need negative relationships for good outcomes so but now the further challenge could be or you could argue that the relationship actually or the alliance is just the epiphenomenon of prior symptom change. So actually the alliance outcome correlation would be an artificial out, uh, correlation because it's just represent the change before alliance is assessed. And what I would like to show here is a meta-analysis uh, based on 17 different data sets of eight different countries. And we investigated these different data sets with the very same um, syntax. And what we saw or found is actually that the argument on one hand is right that positive symptoms or uh, symptoms in sense of symptom re reductions or a little bit lower symptoms within the patients would predict higher alliance at the end of session. So on this point of view, yes, the argument is not wrong that we could say uh, high within patients, low symptoms, 
push a little bit the post-session alliance ratings. But what we also found is the way, it's the other way around that high alliance is predicted lower symptoms, symptoms at the next sessions. So this seems to be both arguments probably are a little bit reciprocally connected to each other. So if we think about relationship factors, then we could also wonder or just investigate if online therapies, the working alliance in online therapies are comparable to others. And what we can see here is that the correlations between online working alliance and outcome is very astonishing, um, comparable to face-to-face -to -face treatments. And for me, most important, interestingly, was that the argument changed uh, within the past 20 years. That means in 2000, it was really more the discussion that the alliance outcome correlations would be lower in online therapies. And in the past years, it changed. Also, even there was no uh, particular meta-analysis, the, the debate changed and, uh, and it was a little bit the question why the comparable lines outcome connect, um, associations happens also in online therapy. And I suppose this is just the start of the debates or the challenges. We really do not know very precisely what the difference is uh, of these different, of online therapies and face-to-face um, -face therapies are. A challenge, interesting. And actually also a challenge, we do not really know if we go into the studies much about really moment by moment um, changes in the dyadic assessments of patients and clients. And there are quite many also special issues that are just focused on these very interesting research questions. So, and further, and maybe most important or most astonishing is that our research in relationship factors, aligns outcome correlation, is usually based on Western countries. And we have many countries that we are under-researched. And maybe this is the challenge or might be a challenge for the next years to get insights in other non-Western countries. Okay. Also here we can say that relationship wouldn't, this challenge wouldn't explain the whole psychotherapy debate or it's just an aspect that provides variability into our designs. So next challenge we could say, huh, we lost a person actually in our discussions, maybe a little bit. Maybe the clients, the patients. And if we go into this challenge, then if we have a little bit, we would like to discuss actually today, or I would like to discuss study designs, then usually we just investigate in clinical psychology, clinical concepts in clinical populations. And there are not so many studies that just investigate also more general concepts in clinical populations. Just to bring here an example would be ecological momentary assessment, where we assess positive as well as negative episodes within patients with GAD, with generalized anxiety disorders. And what we find generally, but of course it has to be replicated and so on, but what we see 
fact is that patients, of course, will experience negative episodes, but also positive episodes during the day. And if we go a little bit further, then we could say, huh, okay, interestingly, we not only can investigate clinical populations to get really the broad picture of a psychological concept, we also need contrast with general populations in sense of general concepts and clinical concepts. And to bring here an example, that would be a study where we investigated a memory updating task. We had here different patients, population subclinical with generalized anxiety disorder, comorbid populations and healthy populations. And what we did is we measured this memory task two times, working memory task. And here were the hypotheses. We thought, based on the literature, that the patients, that the psychotherapy patients, probably would be a little bit lower or slower in the, oops, in the, in the second working memory um, round because it's a, it would be a little bit long for them and so they would be a little bit tired and so they would be not so fast and in the other way around or that would be the question if in the healthy population that maybe they are faster because they could maybe help the concentration and so the second working memory task would be faster. That would be the hypothesis. To get to the results, what we can see here, interestingly, is yes, we have the hypothesis, as we can see here, the population, healthy population was faster in the second working memory uh, round. But interestingly, also the patients were faster in the second round and this was unexpected and interestingly it was actually unexpected also in the psychological theories and this is interesting that maybe we had two problem focused theories of the clients. So to get this again to the debate, we can say that of course patients have different problems and maybe more or less severities, but also more or less strength or social support and so on. And maybe in clinical psychology and psychotherapy, we are quite often fastly focused on problems, patient problems. And of course, if we think that the proactive patients might be a consideration and this should be important, then we could also wonder if maybe very different tools than psychotherapy could have an impact maybe on psychotherapy patients but even more maybe on very on normal persons that for example would like to change their personalities and this is just an example here on a very smart mobile cho um, coach and where i was involved um, and Interestingly, also normal people were extremely interested to change their personality. And what we found, these are very preliminary results, that actually the patient, the, 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 the persons just changed in the direction that they desired. So in the desire, they were able to change their personality. So, to get to this debate, actually, we just could say, okay, patients might be proactive, and it's quite difficult 
to handle this proactivity within traditional designs where we would like just to investigate more homogeneous, um, homogeneous populations. So maybe it's time for one or two questions. Are there persons that have questions until now? So I'm going to open up here just to make sure on the questions tab. If anyone has any questions for Chris, you can write it on the questions tab and I can read it out loud. Or you can put up the little hand raising icon if you have something to ask. So let's just give it a second. So that seems not the point, or actually we can discuss it later on. Okay. So it just shows that we have that psychotherapy research seems to be quite complex or challenging, that we have different debates or different frameworks, how we can think about uh, the effectiveness of, uh, of psychotherapy. So and we could say, Whoa, that's too much. That's really too much. It blows up as any design because it's really too complex. And we have too much noise in the designs. We can't find anything. That would be a little bit question. But I have a dessert. And I think, or I suppose, no, these are challenges. We Maybe we can get combinations of all these different aspects. And what I would like to present you is just some examples of designs that where we can uh, make a combination of different aspects or challenges. So here, that would be just an example of a randomized control trial. What we can see here is that more uh, one group of therapists was primed or had a preparation, a very specific preparation for sessions. In sense that they that was a little bit like the normal or usual supervision. What's the problem of the client and how we can address the problem within the um, within the manual? And so this would be a little bit the traditional approach, but we could also say a slightly different. For example, we could wonder if the, we could wonder if a positive episode would be helpful for the therapist to involve the client into the very same manual. So it's actually a slightly different perspective how we can involve clients. So, uh, sorry about this. We have here now these three conditions. One condition here with the problem attitude or how we can address the problems within the design and then two more resource or strength oriented conditions. To get a very long story short, what if here are the results of the uh, of the symptom change within the client's populations. What we can see here is the, the, the problem group had actually quite a good uh, symptom reduction from pre to post. But also, the strength-oriented groups had a slightly faster symptom reduction. And actually, these effect sizes were astonishing high at post-treatment. How we can, that's an interesting that we found such a huge effect between these different conditions. And actually, it's also interesting that we had a within replication of these, within study replication of two groups. So they were quite comparable, these groups. 
in symptom change. How we were able to find these design or these effects, I suppose the one reason was that we really had a very selective group of patients that there, there was not much variation of different clients, so they had them more or less the same age, they had generalized anxiety disorder, they had the more or less the same socioeconomic status. And also the therapists were quite comparable to each other. They were at the same age, the same level of education and so on. So this means if we maybe if we standardized all these different contexts, then maybe we could be able to find also quite interesting differences between groups. Or uh, the other way around, do you know any randomized controlled trial that just randomized attitudes of therapists or just yeah also manipulated attitudes of therapists and if they have an effect but what you also see here in this study is that there is no sleeper effect so at the follow-up all different groups were quite more or less comparable. So now you could argue, huh, yeah, okay, these were different groups and this is more or less interesting, but me personally, I'm interested if I'm better in one kind of treatment preparation than in the other. So it's the more the resource approach better for me than the problem approach or not. This would be maybe the more important or more naturalistic question than just the question is in general one group better than the other. And actually for such kind of questions we do not really have many designs. And this is just a proposal of one design. And here it's an ABAB design of for one therapist. Actually, he would, for example, start with implementation A condition, then B, and again A and B. And we will repeat this within 20 therapists. With such a design that we actually just conducted here in Zurich, we would be able to address now this different also different challenges or different debates but this now is a little bit nerd modus because it's mode it's a statistical question actually we can with this design now just on a session level we are able to just model symptom reduction of each patient then we would be able to just investigate if the implementation group A is different from implementation group B. And then of course, at therapist level, we can in investigate this therapist skills and if they have impact. And of course, also the preferences, which is now written in German, I'm very sorry about this, but preferences, this would be here, preferences could also have an impact if therapists are prefer A or B. So this would be just an example that maybe the combination of or the designing very specific designs could be interesting for future psychotherapy research or just to be a little bit more open to explore different designs than maybe the more or less usual design, for example, treatment versus uh, a particular psychotherapy versus treatment as usual or something like this. Okay, I very much hope that this presentation until now uh, was a little bit able to just show you a little bit what the challenges 
in this definition of psychotherapy research could be. So I hope that I discussed a little bit these different aspects of psychotherapy research that makes psychotherapy research also quite complex and challenging. So, what would be the conclusions of this uh, webinar for PhD projects? So, research standards often re refer to one challenge, for example, randomized control trial that investigates just one particular treatment. And it's important maybe to know which standard is addressed in a particular design. And of course, for PhDs, do not fight against, for example, a predominant challenge or specific interest of your advisor or your department. So actually, just to get a little bit of awareness that maybe there are different challenges here and different debates, and maybe a supervisor is more interested in one aspect than in the other. So, but on a more theoretical point of view, we, we also could argue that there is no right or wrong challenge. So there are different challenges and this is, makes psychotherapy research also very interesting. And now this seems to me the most important pro um, point that actually prior generations of psychotherapists to uh, psychotherapy researchers didn't solve the problem. So there is really much, much room for creativity, for new approach to think the world really very, very different in many very different frameworks that weren't tested before. And of course, there's probably psychological knowledge outside of psychotherapy that we can use, for example, from working in organizational uh, psychology, from social psychology, and so on. So this just means that there is much openness in this research in area. The second conclusion for a PhD or for a project planning could be that, of course, if we have all these challenges in mind that provide a source of variance, then all these challenges are actually on a theoretical but also a design issue consideration point of view, a confound. And maybe it would be, on one hand, good to just use all these different challenges to, to brainstorm and to, to, to get creative ideas of potential confounds. But on the other hand, maybe it's also a good strategy, strategy at the beginning of a research project to really think about these different challenges and at least to get a data collection uh, of all these challenges. For example, to assess the particular therapies, to assess uh, maybe also relationships aspects and so on. One further and sometimes neglect aspect is to just to keep the confounds constant, constant as possible. So, Sometimes, and it makes sense to have a very focused research question, but if we have a very focused research question, then we also, it's a good idea to have, to keep constant as possible the other confounds. So that means that we have to standardize for, for example, patients' characteristics or also therapist characteristics and so on to just not have too much variability of um, variability within the de designs that are not interesting in respect to the particular hypothesis. So that brings me to C. It makes ex very sense to formulate very explicit inclusion exclusion criterion and to really have a 
good ideas why we exclude, for example, also patients or what, what, what are the advantages and disadvantages to exclude patients and so on. But of course, uh, other strategy would be to just collect huge data, which we also have in psychotherapy research and where we investigate natural variation within um, huge samples. But usually we do not have enough power to investigate interaction terms. This means that it doesn't make sense, too much sense to just address all the different debates within one designs usually. And it's, it makes extremely sense to be focused within for just one research question. So conclusions to conceptualize manuscripts probably is focusing on one research question is important and also to design study designs that are focused on one research question makes sense. And it may also make sense to address the other challenges in our manuscripts. For example, in the, uh, that we just describe the data in the method sections, for example, patient, therapist, intervention, process, and so on. And it's always not a bad idea to just have some thoughts about if the challenges, different challenges impact missing data. And if this is not missing at random, maybe we have really, really a systematic bias in this collection or the missings in the missing data. And it makes sense, of course, to just accept the other channels just to conceptualize limitations. And of course, one reviewer might prefer a challenge and it often doesn't make sense to just discuss with the reviewer to just say this challenge doesn't make sense because probably this review will have the heart and soul or just his ideas why the particle challenge is important. So thank you team to just provide the exam that we just can discuss and that these are not just examples to discuss and not perfect examples or something like this. And of course, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Chris. You already have three questions here that I can read out loud, but first let me just invite anyone who wants to ask anything to Chris. You can either raise your hand in that little raised hand icon you have on the dashboard, or you can leave a question on the questions tab and I'll read it out loud. So Chris, let me start off uh, with a question here. And I wanna say sorry beforehand because I am sure I'm gonna butcher someone's name, but please bear with me. So Jackie Kotufa asks you, thank you for a really interesting talk. It's such a complex process trying to measure psychotherapy effectiveness from process research. I feel like it's often done as a secondary analysis in RCTs that were not even originally designed to measure process. In measuring patient input in the psychotherapy process, how are you able to distinguish between therapist contribution, patient contribution, and their interaction? For example, if you're measuring behavioral change as a patient variable, or even something like motivation, how can we ever argue that we have singled out their individual effect when it's so difficult to design studies with a precise experimental manipulation of these variables? I totally agree with um, the statement that um, our RCTs often are quite general and not very uh, focused on one, one more process aspect. So we have many tons of designs that just compare one or two traditional orientations with each other. But it's, I suppose it would be more or less interesting to keep 
also traditional constants and for example to change motivate to just manipulate you know, uh, to manipulate for example motivation and so on and so i suppose we there is much room also in psychotherapy research to to just explore different defined signs from the more traditional ones so let me move on to this second question by wolfgang and he asks Christoph, I have this problem with pie charts. They suggest that the slices add up to 100%, but aren't they, con they connected by the interaction of therapist variables with alliance with symptoms? Say it again. What, what's, the pro what's the problem, Wolfgang? <laughs> so Wolfgang might want to clarify the question. I can read it again. So the pie, sar pie charts suggest that the slices add up to 100%, but are they connected uh -huh. by the interaction of therapist variables with alliance with symptoms? Yes, of course. Also, yeah, this was just, you know, a, an example of debate. Actually, you're right. If you sum up all, then it would be more than 100%. And actually, also, I suppose it's not really a good idea to just uh, think in, you know, um, in slide, in slices in sense of uh, variability of course there are interactions and so on and which means that it gets even more complex as just we discussed all these different debates but the point what i would like to state is that of course we just we can on a theoretical point of view even we can't maybe design all these interactions within one design but we can discuss it more or less and actually also we can more or less accept different challenges maybe for psychotherapy research society this is not really a very huge topic but i suppose for other societies uh, in psychotherapy, behavioral therapy and so on, to accept these different challenges is, I don't know, is also a challenge. <laughs> yeah. So here's another one by Saja, and he, she asks, what does it mean strength-oriented group? Did they get therapy or just strength-oriented intervention? Okay, just to, I just get back to this slide here and just uh, I would like to show you maybe this one here. Actually, they had the very same. The, the goal was to, to really conduct the very same manual, manualized treatment, but they had a slightly different preparation. They just wondered how I can use the strength of the patients to conduct the, this particular manual. It doesn't mean that they neglect, for example, uh, the symptoms or, or GAD symptoms and so on, but it's just a little bit another approach to also be sensitive on the positive episodes of these clients and how they can use these positive episodes for so, uh, for some change or to get involvement into the manual. Mm -hmm. So here's another question. Um, what is your, this is by Marcella. What is your advice to psychotherapists starting out in research? How and where to start with limited resources and little experience in psychotherapy research? Which empirical framework is better or easier to start in? For research or for to conduct the, to as therapist, that's not so. Is is it a question for a therapist or just a researcher? I, be, I believe it. It's uh, to research psychotherapy. So, what's your advice for psychotherapists starting out in research? How okay. and when start with limited. Research? Okay. Okay. I would just say, yeah, of course, we have now 100 years of experience to be very, very quite focused on clinical episodes and to get an understanding of particular disorders and so on. And that's great. And it doesn't mean that we should neglect all these 
theories and, and actually to be honest i don't know many theories uh, clinical theories that are uh, in the last let's say 15 years that i would say these are this uh, this is this is not really has not a theoretical foundation so it makes sense to really be focused also on these theories but it doesn't mean that we can't add on something more experimental or more creative this is just an invitation to, to be open and do not do not to be too shy you know to get a phd for example so i have a last question here from my portuguese friend nunu and he asks challenge five seems quite interesting however the example you gave seems doable by big teams or big departments is it not a challenge to design such potentially productive designs for smaller teams, especially if one wants to reach the countries in white on your map? Could you think of smaller oh. contributions to the field? It feels like fishing where only big boats in some areas are allowed to go fishing. What about smaller boats? Smaller projects well designed, once aggregated and replicated, contribute to the nested design field, no? Any hopeful examples? Yes, of course, uh, and this uh, actually, this was not such a huge study actually uh, in, in example five. And, um, but it seems to me a, a random factor can be extremely small also. For example, just, yeah, uh, it's, it's a research study in, in our group where we just did a manipulation we, we had two groups. One group did um, a letter for, from the, the chief of the clinic where she, he or she just said, you are important in my clinic. Clients are important. Please give feedback to the therapist. This is very welcome. And the other group hadn't, had not such a letter. This was just, and then we just investigated if the re re relationship changed after this very short manipulation. So this means to me that I suppose we really can, uh, even we do not have always uh, to keep constant uh, the patient char characteristic. Of course, it makes sense that we, we try to, to have very we are homogeneous group but also if we have mixed group or we can really think about very tiny interventions or uh, manipulations to get insights how psychotherapy works okay chris you have one last question actually another one this is by danilo and he asks, any recommendation for a postdoc project from an early stage researcher? Yeah, that's a difficult question, but I, I think, yeah, we have these five challenges and if you are postdoc, you really, uh, yeah, you have an open door to, to get all these challenges. And, and actually it's a little bit the question what, what's interesting for you and then I just would take uh, what, what's really your motivation. Mm -hmm. Then I would probably select one or two challenges. And but I suppose this is um, actually a motivational question for you personally. So Chris, we don't have any more questions at the moment. So I want to leave you maybe with the opportunity to have one last you know, take home message that you want people to take with them from this webinar, maybe any particular idea that you want to highlight to finish us off? Yeah, I would just, uh, I would just highlight this openness and uh, about psychotherapy research or just that you, we also can think in other boxes than the usual standards and that it makes sense to really also 
ja, think very open-minded. And that would be a little, I hope that this was a little bit, uh, yeah. Hmm. Webinar was a little bit in this direction. Well, thank you so much. I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone. Thank you so much for this really cool webinar and for tingling our nerd modes on. And I want to tell everyone that uh, this webinar was recorded. And so it will be online on uh, the Vimeo page of SPR. Uh, once it's online, I'll post it on the Facebook uh, of SPR. So again, Chris, just want to thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you very much. And I hope it was more or less understandable <laughs> with my English. So thank you very, very much. Very much so. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Until next time.